Thanks to the panelists. Thank you, uh, Peter and uh, panel, uh, for laying out um, some of the terrain that needs to be traversed and showing that there are others who have uh, traversed the terrain before that uh, might uh, help show the way uh, while acknowledging the specificity or, or the, the uh, unique nature of many of the issues in health and health care. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to uh, invite the next uh, moderator as the panel members uh, take their seats. Uh, Mike Johns is, uh, he's a good friend <laughs> for, for one very important uh, observation and a longtime colleague uh, uh, here in the National Academy of Medicine and in the health field generally. Uh, he uh, was a charter member of our uh, leadership consortium, the predecessor leadership consortium for value and science driven uh, uh, health system and an important um, leader of that activity. Uh, and it, for the last, uh, oh, must be at least 20 years, uh, uh, I won't give you the exact number because that would age us both, uh, has, uh, has built uh, the uh, health system at Emory into a global leader on, on many, many dimensions. Um, and in addition, in his spare time, uh, he has served a, as the chair um, of uh, one of the important activities in interoperability and that is the Center for Medical Interoperability. Uh, Mike, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the podium and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, I appreciate it. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you and to hear all of your opinions and thoughts and uh, uh, suggestions. Um, of course, we're gonna get this all integrated and we'll all be moving on really fast. Um, We've got a great panel here with us, um, and they are kind of representative of our uh, health ecosystem in that uh, we have Julian Goldman from uh, Partners Healthcare, anesthesiologist. I think they all recognize that point of care problem. Uh, they all get tired of those bells going off. Um, Lori McGraw from the American Medical Association, so we have the physicians. Uh, Ed Miller, who's from the center, but also came to us from uh, the cable lab, so he's kind of got a, a dual center and actually knows how things operate and work. Um, and then Andy Gettinger uh, from our government and ONC, and we're pleased that you're all here. Now, I, I'm gonna make a few opening comments. I've gotta say that I've been described as an impatient, uh, realistic optimist who talks too much. And that's pretty fitting. I mean, I'd say it's fair enough. I, I don't have any problem with that. Um, so I, I write things down when I'm gonna try to stick to it so I can get this thing done and, three to four minutes. Um, I've got to say that uh, I mean, I'm a person who loves change. And this is kind of tough sometimes for you know, your health system CEO and you just like to change things, uh, usually for the better. Uh, and so the, the real trick of being a leader is how do you, I think we heard that uh, just in the last panel, is how do you get people, you've got to lead, how do you get people to change? And how do you get them to kind of grasp onto, let's do things differently? Uh, and I, I, I kind of like that kind of stuff. Now, I'm, I'm a sort of, I don't like the term, but it's the term, a health system executive or CEO. I've done that in a couple of institutions. Uh, I've even done it on an interim basis. Went down and bothered Julia as much as I could while we installed the Epic, actually while they bothered me. Um, I'm a physician, I'm a surgeon actually, so I'm more like an engineer, I guess, because we kind of have a sense of what we want the outcome to be before we start. We sort of know what we're gonna do before we start. In fact, you want a surgeon who will do that. You just don't want an arrogant one. Um, and I've been a patient uh, a number of times uh, in several health systems. Not for anything ex you know, terribly serious, but you know, kidney stones and hitting the, uh, but anyhow, won't go into that. Uh, probably my mo greatest accomplishment, and uh, Stephen can, uh, uh, remark on this as well, is uh, uh, I ordered up a Cerner install, uh, I think it was 2002 or three at Emory. I announced it as we were dedicating a new cancer building. And of course, 
I hadn't told anybody that we were going to do that, including the hospital CEO, the chief medical officer, who came up and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, we've got to do it. Well, we did. It took some time, and I survived. But I didn't get fired, and the faculty and nursing staff did not hang me in effigy, which I considered a high accomplishment. Um, we didn't lose too much money. Actually, it wasn't even noticeable because we made some more money on someplace else. Lots of problems we had to deal with. And you kind of, so I've had some of these experiences, but I don't know anything about this. You know, I get Stephanie to do it. Stephanie, real, she understands what this stuff is all about. So you got to surround yourself with the right kind of people. That's good leadership, by the way. Of course, a little bit surprising to the CIO when we announced this, but he got over that. They kind of liked it. It was going to be a new adventure. So I, I, I think this leadership thing is important. Another side thing, it talked about, I think uh, Peter mentioned, you know, why don't we all get together? And I remember when we were looking at this, I talked to some of my other colleagues who were running uh, health systems around. I said, let's get together and let's decide which system we want to buy and tell them what we want. We could probably get a better deal because we do it. And of course, nobody wanted to do it. Couldn't get, you know, people to come and do it. It was just maybe too crazy of an idea in a way, but, but it was sort of, has always sat in my head. How can we use that purchasing power? And why can't we do more than what we're doing? And why are, are we really that different, our systems that we're running? So that's sort of where I come from. Um, and let me get to the few points, and then uh, we'll try to stay on time. So I'll say this. In order to provide the best care to patients and populations of patients, our delivery system today requires unprecedented access to health health information. Access to data is essential as we migrate to new models of care. I'm stating the obvious, I think, but I want it to be stated again. This includes outcomes-based reimbursement, personalized medicine, and population health. Leading organizations recognize that sustainability and competitive advantage will be driven by their ability to deliver safe, efficient, and economical care and comprehensive data interoperability is crucial and essential to that transformation. So now what's meant by that term, comprehensive interoperability? Well, the data needs to flow seamlessly and securely within the episodes of care or at the point of care across care settings and be available to the person and their trusted healthcare professionals. So despite, I think, many valuable, well-intended initiative, initiatives that have occurred, there's still a great deal of fragmentation, lack of coordination for comprehensive interoperability. So there's work to be done. So healthcare providers, clinicians, and other end users of health data are actually best positioned to drive this coordination as the purchasers and primary users of health information technology solutions, clinical applications, and devices. They are the ones who can define the needs and requirements for the best possible data exchange approaches to treat patients and populations. Imagine the impact of the collective influence of hospitals and health systems, physicians, nurses, other care providers, and most importantly, patients and patient advocacy organizations. If a provider and patient-led collaborative coordinated its activities and aligned around mutually reinforcing goals and incentives, the health sector would finally have the concentrated leadership that it needs to realize the comprehensive interoperability in state, end state. So this system level view includes, one, a mandate that's person-centered. Two, all episodes of care and transitions of care have the benefit, benefit of it and three, enables a data-driven marketplace. For patients, interoperability <coughs> allows individuals to become known entities throughout the continuum of care and offers the opportunity for them to become their own data brokers. So today, massive quantities of data are generated to support a wide range of medical and healthcare functions, including, among others, clinical decision support, disease surveillance, and population health management. New data streams, structured and unstructured, are cascading into the healthcare realm 
from fitness devices, genetics, genomics, all the omics, maybe even the uh, microbi microbiome omic, <laughs> um, social media, and other sources. But relatively little of this data can presently be captured, stored, and organized so that it can be manipulated by computers and analyzed for useful information. Healthcare applications in particular need more efficient ways to combine and convert varieties of data, including automating, conver uh, automating conversion from structured to unstructured data. We heard about that. When this happens, it will be possible to design and make use of an individual's digital persona that would include a complete collection of data pertaining to his or her health, wellness, genomics, consumer, social characteristics, behavioral information, and communal status. A complete and holistic view of the person then arms the ecosystem to focus innovation on creating person-centered products, services, and treatment that improve outcomes all the way down to the level of the individual. And that really is the economic unit in the future of healthcare. So I'm going to cut this short, and I think you've got the point. And I'd like to say that uh, our four members are going to speak to you. We'll try to end on time. Well, actually, we will because they are very efficient in what they're going to say, uh, right? And uh, Julian is going to hit it off, and then uh, Lori, uh, Ed, and uh, Andy, I think they're all sitting in that order. So, Julian. Well, in that case, I get to thank you again. <laughs> I'd like to thank Dr. Wong for all of her hard work um, herding cats and doing everything required for an activity like this. And I'd like to thank Dr. Pronovost as well. And the mic was off when I thanked you. Thanks again. Uh, well, talking about interoperability uh, as we have been today, it's, it's an enormous scope. We've talked a lot about patient access to data, health information exchanges, and each of us probably has our own pet area, even though we, you, you've been talking about comprehensive and acknowledging the range of potential areas. I was asked to speak specifically about patient safety. And in thinking about some of the conversations, we've discussed what's the value proposition for interoperability? Well, maybe we should be thinking not about procuring interoperability, but we should be thinking about procuring safety because we know the value proposition for patient safety. And maybe that has to be the focus, at least in some aspect, of procuring interoperability. So I'd like to go down that pathway a bit and uh, focus a lot on how could we potentially uh, make our clinical environments more error resistant, and then what does that translate down into at a technical level? And since I have five minutes, I don't think it really will be a problem to cover that scope. <laughs> Okay, so the green button doesn't go forward. Um, that's the laser. I know that doesn't go forward. Sorry, I interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> well, are there any questions? Uh, still not having success with the slide advance. You know how to work it the last time. Is this, this is, it's not interoperable, I think. Is the, it's not operable. It's not operable. <laughs> Good point. Well, while this is being, ah, there we go. Okay, I think that's the last, no, it's the first slide. So <clears throat> I think the top line message here is that health environments need integrated technologies and rich data to improve patient safety and enable learning and transformational care delivery models. I think we all agree that that's the case. So how do we get there? Well, hard question, but we asked that question back in 2004 and that's when we started our program at Mass General Hospital on medical device interoperability. Now, because interoperability wasn't yet in the spell checker and doesn't roll off the tongue, we called the program Plug and Play. So MDPNP for medical device plug and play. So we opened a lab in 2006, which has been a vendor neutral collaboration environment. We just expanded the lab, lab markedly a few months ago. And we've had and been working with clinical biomedical engineering, computer scientists, and IT subject matter experts uh, all this time. We publish our output uh, in peer-reviewed journals and share demonstrations publicly. As you can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, we, were, we led the closed-loop healthcare um, activity uh, with the Smart America initiative that was uh, led out of the White House a few years ago, I think when Anish was there, and some other work on Ebola response. So our work is very much um, publicly facing. And we've been fortunate to be funded through uh, over $22 million of research 
uh, grants and contracts uh, from federal research, and so we, we feel that should be delivered back to the public. What we've learned along the way has led us to work on a, a standard for the architectural needs near the patient for integrating medical devices and to deliver safer systems, a platform-based standard, uh, which we're starting to see uh, being adopted commercially. We've also worked very closely with the FDA uh, in order to ensure and bring in collaborators under a research collaboration agreement to help clarify the safety pathway and the regulatory pathway so that everyone knows there's a, there's a, a way to get to the end game. So the, in the paper that was circulated, there's the use case or clinical scenario of the patient-controlled analgesia or PCA safety interlock. And we think about six patients per day in the US either die or are severely injured from overdoses from patient-controlled analgesia. Well, this is not a new problem. And you can see, I won't go through the details in the slide, you have the documentation. This has been discussed for years. And in fact, in 2006, the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation called for safety interlocks and the ability to have open interfaces on infusion pumps so that people could experiment with better algorithms to fuse data from sensors like pulse oximetry, uh, the respiratory monitors to stop a pump. How many of those pumps are on the market today? If you guessed zero, you'd be right. And this use case of PCA is, is an archetypal example because if you could stop a PCA pump when a patient is, has respiratory depression, and if you can do it with some level of certainty because of using multiple sources of data, you could stop a blood transfusion when the patient has signs of a transfusion reaction. You can stop an antibiotic when there's a reaction. But that use case is rich, technically complicated and rich. It touches on every aspect of the system that we've talked about today. So it's one of those use cases that if you can crack that and make that interoperable, you've now delivered probably 60 to 70% of the solution. So what do you need to solve that problem? Well, there's a list one through four. Well, we need apps to integrate data, and that means we need the community of scientists and engineers, clinicians, to develop those apps because they'll be different for different populations, different medications, different coexisting illnesses. We need devices that can provide the rich data set that's needed, and we need the open platforms that has been discussed extensively today. And we need to be able to deliver safe interoperability, that is, safer systems to reduce harms, to make it harder to cause a problem, and they have to work reliably and safely. So, boy, that's easy. We collect all this data today anyway. It's simple, right? Well, here are some, here's some real data. Uh, on the top left, you can see a photo of a, of a patient's physiological monitor, and circled in red, it shows that the saturation is 84%. The EMR in the picture below shows no evidence of a drop in oxygen saturation. So oxygen saturation can vary quickly over time, and depending upon when the data is sampled and when it's put in the EMR, you may or may not see the event. So to think that we can have algorithms like this that can improve safety and catch critical events and tuck those into at least today's EMRs is really not likely to ever happen. If you look on the right, you can see another example. Circled in red is a low pulse ox saturation value, and it's about whatever it is in the low 90s. It's lower than all the others that are in the upper 90s. Well, we had many patients that have these recurrent desaturations in the EMR. So what should you do with those patients? Have a sleep study, evaluate them further, keep them in the recovery room longer, who knows what their problem is. Well, for almost all of them, the problem is that the pulse oximeter is on the same arm as the blood pressure cuff. And every time it cycles, it causes a desaturation. Now, a clinician with eyes and a brain looking at a patient anyone, any nurse, student, so they all know to ignore that data. But now that we've committed that data into an EMR and we've lost the contextual information, and because the devices don't send the metadata that's needed, and what metadata is needed? Maybe that the blood pressure monitor is in, cuff is inflating. What metadata is needed on the left? The averaging time is important. A long averaging time, you lose the data. So with these kind of concepts in mind, we worked a number of years ago to help establish a, an architectural basis for connecting devices safely and having an app platform that can be used for these kinds of patient safety applications. And given the time, I won't go into detail, but I'll point out that if you look at a, at a handful of use cases, maybe five to 10, like the PCA, you suddenly identify almost all of the system um, engineering requirements. And I'm gonna use that term generally in this uh, because we don't have the time to dig into what that means. 
So we, did, we worked with a group in 2009 to develop the ICE standard, the standard for the integrated clinical environment, which was recognized by the FDA in 2013. And it provides the, the notion of an app platform for the things we discussed and sandboxing of data around the patient to provide security. And also to have a common time reference. At Anish Chopra's behest, when he was a CTO at the White House, he sent me with marching orders uh, to go dig into the problem of the accuracy of clock times on medical devices. So our team, um, in collaboration with the folks at Hopkins and Penn and the VA, studied 2,000 medical devices in five hospitals, and we found that 5% of those devices had the correct time. 95% had the incorrect time, and the largest clock time error was 42 years. <laughs> so this, this would cause any IT system to fail. And we expect to build a safer healthcare delivery system if we don't even know what time it is. So that's where this architecture came from so that we can solve some of these things. And this is just material that can be used perhaps uh, in the future as the report is updated or as this work continues. The last slide I have is this one, also to show some work that can be leveraged. Uh, a number of years ago, we developed in collaboration with, with Kaiser, Hopkins, and partners. In fact, this is based on Kaiser's language. We worked on a document called MD FHIR. I know it's confusing, but it predates FHIR. <laughs> what could I say? <laughs> so MD FHIR is an open source, uh, under Creative Commons language, procurement document, which has been used by quite a few healthcare delivery systems, and they pick and choose paragraphs that are helpful for procuring interoperable devices. It's a, not a terribly mature document, but we've learned a lot, quite, we've learned quite a bit from both its successes and its failures. Um, in 2012, the VA uh, CTO signed onto MD FHIR, and two years ago, the American Society of Anesthesiologists endorsed it as well. And this is also available on the web. Uh, we're adding cybersecurity content to the document, and again, it's, it's material that could help inform uh, the pathway that we've been discussing today. Um, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, the, the folks that have, we've collaborated with over the years, um, including a number of federal grants from uh, people that are in this room who represent those agencies. And uh, without that, we really wouldn't have made even the limited progress that we've made today. And of course, if, if the Moore Foundation folks are on the phone, thank you uh, as well. And with that, uh, well, let's move on. Terrific, thank you. And I want to echo, um, you know, Julian's comments on just, you know, a sincere thank you for this forum and this opportunity to collaborate in this um, very meaningful way. I also really appreciated the um, other industry perspectives. Um, so I have been in the healthcare IT industry for well over 25 years, mainly working on electronic health records. I'm two years now with the American Medical Association. But 30 years ago, I was a cognitive science student and I was working at the Naval Underwater Systems Center in Newport, Rhode Island, and I was working on a study of cognitive laterality in displays in nuclear submarines. And at that point in time, it, we were dealing with green screens. We were not dealing with green screens that moved. We were dealing with no animation. We were dealing with green screens that had words and some very limited diagrams. And at that 30 years ago, it was very important to the Navy to know that for a commanding officer of a nuclear submarine, the fractions of a millisecond in terms of how a display was presented to a commanding officer, whether spatial information went to the left or right side of the brain or words, those fractions of a second mattered. And now I've spent you know, decades later my time in healthcare IT, and I see Meredith's personal record of her care, um, which is critically important to her treatment plans, how she's receiving care, and for any physician or caregiver who needs to consume that information in a way to effectively deliver something meaningful um, for her, um, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> and so, you know, we talked earlier about sort of like the imperatives that we have for interoperability. I do believe those imperatives are here. They're economic imperatives. There are moral imperatives. And while we may have PTSD from all of the adoption of the electronic health records, and I do appreciate, Mickey, your comments, but we have made um, a lot of progress, there's a lot more to do. So I'm here to represent the physicians um, 
perspective. I brought Dr. Michael Hodgkins, a physician, with me from the AMA. Um, and the AMA has done tremendous amounts of studying on things, physician dissatisfiers. There's been tremendous study on physician burnout. Um, and one of the largest dissatisfiers for physicians in dealing with technology most certainly is the electronic health record that I personally spent my entire life working on. You're welcome. It's really important. Um, but um, if, <laughs> if, if, you, if you dive into that deeper, um, you, know, you might expect that physicians also have a low appetite for advanced innovative digital tools because of the adoption of technology that has not had the results that really has um, been desired, that we all desired, that we all work very, very hard on. And what we found, it, what we found is that physicians have an enormous appetite for excellent um, tools and innovation and technology as you work with all of the um, innovation and entrepreneurs who expect to bring tons of advanced new um, tools to the system. Um, there's, there's a great appetite for it, but physicians want to know, does it work? Will I get paid? Will I get sued? And how does it integrate into my practice? And as we dig into that more, it is not the tools themselves that is the problem. What the AMA has found, and I think that what you know, we've heard from a number of the other speakers, the organization of the data itself, the clinical context that comes with that data, rather than having to go through tomes and tomes and tomes of records that look like meritous information, a well-organized clinical data is some of the most important um, information made available in the right context to move around the healthcare ecosystem. Okay, so that leads me to what I want to briefly talk to you about today. The AMA, in all of this study that um, has been going on, it has been important to not just study and talk about it and advocate um, for legislation and other things um, to deal with these issues, but there has been an imperative to actually do something about it. The Integrated Health Model Initiative is an initi a data, health data collaborative that the AMA launched um, just at the end of last year. What it is, is a common data model um, solution. So what we are trying to do is recognize that in healthcare today, there is a need for a common data model, a medical information model, that is also a master coding system. So today we have a tremendous amount of ways to um, actually uh, talk about uh, different data elements, whether those are SNOMED codes or CPT or ICD um, and the like. But there are additionally, when we're dealing with value-based care or patient-centered care, things like patient outcomes, patient goals, patient state, that we don't have ways to describe in standards-based um, ways. The common um, data model, the integrated health model, is meant to be a common data model made freely available to the healthcare ecosystem so that technology vendors, EHR vendors, app developers, registries, any system that organizes data can use this common data model so that we can achieve a level of semantic interoperability as data moves um, around the healthcare system. It's intended to integrate existing code sets, so we're not intending to, to make a new code set, add these additional data elements, organize it in a context, and then as we get to things like wellness and population health, um, we expect this to be tremendously helpful. Uh, a few things about this initiative. I have two slides and that I will be done. But this initiative um, starts with an online digital platform that is open and available to anyone, it te technologists, physicians, clinicians, anybody in the healthcare ecosystem to understand what is the best evidence-based um, data to support, what are the data elements that we need to describe hypertension, diabetes, asthma, just a few of the clinical areas we are starting with. The AMA then convenes a clinical review group to evaluate whether these submissions meet the best science, meet some rigorous standards that are all transparent and available on this online platform. 
If they do pass this clinical review process, all transparent, it moves to a team of informaticists um, that we have and are working with collaboratively to build them into a model, again, that we make available um, to the system. We have just begun on what will be a very long journey in terms of the, trying to um, provide this integrated health model and solve a pretty substantive um, interoperability um, issue. As we've opened the doors, we've had the pleasure of working with some tremendous early collaborators, and we expect many more to be working with us. The AMA knows that this is something that cannot be done alone, and we are looking forward to working with all of you um, um, important forums like this to advance this work. Thank you. Ed? Thanks. So I gather this is working now? <laughs> yes. Well, well, good morning. And uh, Dr. Johns, thank you for uh, moderating the panel and for, and for the introductions. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm excited to speak with you. And, and I'm excited to be, be in healthcare, as Dr. Johns mentioned. Uh, I joined uh, the industry from, from another industry, from, from the cable television industry, uh, operating out of a centralized lab that, uh, that Oscar described. Uh, where we were able to drive interoperability and change and innovation at a global scale. And we didn't do that because of the technology. The technology alone wouldn't have solved the problem. We did that because the leaders of the industry were, were willing and able to align around the technology and drive the procurement decisions. And, and that's the power of a centralized lab. So, I'm, I'm excited and, and just thrilled to be here in, in healthcare because I think this is a much more important problem to solve than, than, than high-speed internet and, and, and digital video. And, and like others, uh, for me, it's, it's, a personal, it's a personal mission. Um, my, my father passed away due to, the, la due to the, the right piece of information not being available to the right person at the right time. And because of that, the wrong decisions were made. He had cancer and, and he passed. It was completely preventable. So I, I'm here to hopefully prevent that for, for others and, and maybe, maybe for myself, right, if we, if we get this solved. So that is the definition of data liquidity, getting the right information to the right, right person at the right time. So as the, uh, the technologist and, and the CTO uh, at the center, I'm, uh, I want to start by saying that this isn't really a technology problem. Uh, all the technology that is needed is, um, has already been developed and, and invented. Uh, it's, it's applied in, in other industries. So a technology initiative that's, that's only technology wouldn't really um, achieve interoperability, and, and that's why so many uh, technology-based initiatives struggle for adoption. This is much more complex than that. This is a, about aligning an ent entire ecosystem. So you, re you need the right technology pieces, of course, um, but, but you need to align uh, the interests of, of all the seven dimensions of this chart, uh, the clinical interests, which, which you were discussing, the, uh, the economics architecture that, that Meredith mentioned, the ec ecosystem players, the regulatory pieces, uh, the, the health system adoption of the technologies and, 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 and the, the models, and, and finally the person uh, that this all applies to, the, uh, the caregiver, uh, the, the administrative, the operations person, and, and most importantly, the patient. So that requires a, a lot of leadership. And, and the leaders that, that can make the changes really are, are the CEOs that, that, that drive the, the decisions of their companies. And, and the industry has the ability to, to align uh, around a sec set of uh, technology and uh, interoperability interface specifications that, that can and will drive the change. So um, someone said that engineers begin with the end in mind, so I've, I've been exposed already as, a, as an engineer because <laughs> I really do think we should begin in the end of mind, and, and there are many ends, right? So this is a discussion about data liquidity, but as uh, Julian uh, Goldman mentioned, uh, there's also safety and usability and, and, and many, many ends. But I'll talk about uh, data, liqui data liquidity, and, and we define data, liqui data liquidity as the ability to deliver the right piece of information to the right person at the right time, free of um, uh, technical, political, or, or financial blocking. Uh, and 
Data, liqui data liquidity requires interoperability, obviously, as a condition precedent, but it's not sufficient. You need interoperability applied to the right system architecture to, to make that happen. So you could have point-to-point -point interoperability that, that gets data from point A to point B, but it doesn't go to point C where it needs to go to. So the center is focused on, on three broad technical campaigns. Uh, one is uh, developing the trust, so trusted infrastructure and, and medical devices. Uh, two is a campaign to really uh, sort out those, those interfaces that, that allow uh, any device or system to interoperate with any other device or system in, in the ecosystem. And then third is that, that system architecture. Uh, we are beginning uh, with um, a focus on, on the point of care, which is shown at the bottom of this diagram, and with a view uh, towards comprehensive interoperability that addresses uh, all of the, uh, the dimensions we mentioned. So th this is a, uh, a diagram of, of what the current state looks like as uh, provided to us by, by our TAC. Um, with you know the, the EMRs and, and the, the applications at the top and, and uh, from the perspective of the point of care that the medical devices at the bottom and in between that is a series of um, uh, proprietary or semi standards based interfaces and, and what brings it together are um, closed middleware solutions that, that translate proprietary A to proprietary B for a fee. And uh, in other cases, the, the, the devices and systems aren't connected at all, so it's up to, to humans to, to fill the gap. And basically, this is just, it's, it's full of entropy. There are many, many good technology initiatives uh, in the industry. Many um, uh, companies and standards bodies are, are driving to, to solve the problem. But, but what it lacks is a strong enough organizing function to pull a solution, a solution through to create the, the market adoption. This is the desired state, and uh, really what, what we're aiming for is plug-and-play interoperability. That's one-to-many, two-way, trusted, and standards-based. So our TAC has asked the sender to really focus on uh, aligning around that, uh, that the middle layer of this diagram and, and streamlining the interfaces uh, above and below. And we're doing that by delivering um, a set of interoperability specifications a set of reference implementation software, and then a strong test and certification program so that the purchasers of technology can, can have an easy metric to know whether or not it'll, it will actually interoperate with other parts of the system. In order to achieve that, uh, we're, we have a model that we call the interoperability maturity model. And the lesson of this model is that if you want plug and play interoperability, you need to consider all of these dimensions, the, the infrastructure, the syntax, the terminology and the semantics, the way that the message flows are, are orchestrated through the system, and the context and the dynamic behavior that comes from having the right piece of metadata the, at, the right, uh, at the right time. So it's really a system architecture model, and you need to think about the needs of the whole system. And then finally, I want to go back um, to where we started, or where I started talking about um, the cable industry and the power of leadership. Uh, this is a, a graph of the growth in that industry. It's, um, it's not dollars, but it's million of, millions of subscriptions. And um, there's a funny word on there called doxis that, that uh, uh, Oscar mentioned. Uh, that, that was a marketing term invented by engineers, but really it's the, the, the interface specification that the cable industry adopted that allowed that modem in your home to interoperate with their system pr to provide high-speed internet. And that became adopted globally, and, and the cost of that modem dropped from $500 when they started to, 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 uh, to $300 to $100 to under $50. So the cost went way down. But what's interesting is, is look at the growth in this curve when, when the CEOs of the industry decided to align around interoperability. Doxis wasn't the last initiative, it was the first. They did high-speed internet, voice over IP, uh, digital video, business services, and, and the uh, trajectory continues. The interesting uh, thing about this slide is to look at the blue bars. The blue bars are, is the legacy that they started with, and it's a proprietary legacy. Uh, had they not made that strategic decision, that industry might be in a very different position today. So I just want to put this up and say that procurement-backed interoperability absolutely can work. 
the challenges are, 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 of course, large in healthcare, require a lot of effort and a lot of coordination, uh, but it can be done. Thank you. <laughs> good morning, or actually good afternoon. I'm Andy Gettinger. Like all federal employees, I'm supposed to do a disclaimer. So uh, my comments today may or may not be those of my agency, my department, or the US government in general. And I'm actually going to talk about my life before I was a clinical informaticist. For those who've known me, um, I actually was an ICU director. I'm a critical care specialist, um, and that's what I cut my teeth on. And it would be inappropriate for me to go back and talk in the context that we've done for this report about the macro level. Dr. Rucker did an excellent job of that. Of course, I would say he did an excellent job. He's my boss. My former boss is sitting right in front of me. It's quite an opportunity for me to speak. Um, as the ICU director for over a decade, um, I really focused on the meso part of things. Um, and before I'm done, I'm going to tell you about the micro part of things. That was last summer when I was actually a patient in my former institution. And I had surgery in July. And you're going, what the hell? Someone who knows what happens in July electively <laughs> chose to have surgery in July, but I did. Um, so. I'm just going to I, oh, <clears throat> come the end of June, the beginning of July, in teaching hospitals, there's a transition. And the people making the decisions about the actual care are the now newly minted MDs. Uh, it can be a challenging time, and there are all kinds of reports in the literature about the actual impact on outcome. So um, most smart folks associated with academic medical centers scheduled their own surgery for May or June. Um, Thank you. Obviously, I'm not smart. <laughs> So I'm going to go back to those days when I'm an ICU director. And um, I started with that paper flow sheet, two sides. Nurses would fill it out every hour because we had the most critically ill patients around. In my course, uh, it turned into three sides and then four sides. And then ultimately, we started digitizing things. And as we started digitizing things, it got increasingly complex. So I'm going to um, thank Julian for all the work he's done over the years, um, thank others for the work they're trying to do in terms of plug and play. But I'm going to tell you about what actually happens today. I'll get back to me in a little bit. What actually happens today is we have a challenge. We have the electronic health record. I think Julian was articulate in why the electronic health record doesn't necessarily reflect what's happening at the bedside. There's been really good data about clinicians at the bedside pick the best number when they enter it themselves. Um, certainly the case when I do my anesthesia record, I'm not going to put those lows. I'm going to put the average. You know, that reflects what was going on, really. Um, and it doesn't reflect the time that the arterial line stopcock was either open to air or closed to the system. That's the 300 that you get in automated systems. But what does happen is you have to do something that's actually more challenging than I think any of us have acknowledged on the panel. First, we have to pick the right patient in the ADT system or the registration system to align the bedside with that individual patient. We then have to turn the bedside on. It's not plug and play today. And that those signals then at the bedside then go through that mediated intermediary, which needs to be up and running, usually on a local network that may or may not be up and running. And many of those systems don't have contingency plans for when it's not. Um, Anybody who's done ICU medicine knows about the Rose Bowl parade. That's when we take our sickest patients from the ICU, which is a secure environment, relatively, and we transport them down to radiology or to another interventional place. And we mobilize all kinds of things, including transport monitors. 
And some of those events can occur for half an hour, an hour, three hours, four hours. Uh, sometimes you're just sitting out in a hall waiting for your turn at the end of the day. The challenge is you now have to sync all of that data from the transport monitor back into the system. Sometimes that works seamlessly, and there are devices that do that, but more often than not, it doesn't. And that's a problem that we have yet to articulate. Let's, let's sort of um, think a little bit about what ONC is doing in this space. And I'm going to answer a question from my friend at HRSA. He always asks those more challenging questions. We're not doing a lot in the consumer space. Um, we don't define that as our, as our principal focus. You've already heard Dr. Rucker talk about 21st century cures. The thing you haven't heard from today is work that we are doing with our colleagues at CMS and our colleagues across the federal government, which is clinician burden reduction. And I would suggest that the devices we have actually are contributing to the burden. We talk a lot about burden in the ambulatory setting, we talk a lot about burden from the regulatory requirements, but the actual burden is interacting with some of these devices, doing the extra work, and that burden has yet to be fully articulated. Um, we do have some resources, and I would be remiss not to point out some of the resources. And, and even though we host it, the Health IT Playbook, it has content in it which is particularly useful. And we don't, it's not all of our contact. I think if people have looked at that, these are a series of interactive, actionable PDFs. Our safer guides um, are there. We have partnered with AMA, and some of AMA's work is there. We've partnered with other federal agencies. Uh, we also have a contract guide. Because these health IT contracts are very complex, very challenging to affect, and um, we've put some information there about things that could be helpful. So um, before I stop, um, yes, sir, I will keep, keep I, you know, I keep seeing that little look at your watch there, but my lights are still green. Maybe they didn't reset them. So <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just tell you that little bit of story. So I had surgery last uh, July. Everybody seemed to get a lot of traction. I had surgery last July, and because I'm a special 30-year veteran senior leader in this organization, I got to sit in the PACU for six hours while they were trying to find me a bed. Um, and, you know, I got to say hello to a lot of my friends as they went by. What are you doing here? Aren't you in Washington? I said, no, I'm here. Thank you. Um, and then I got transferred in the early evening to probably the least desirable patient room in the surgical area. Um, when we moved into the building uh, that I helped design, um, it was a private room, a one-person room, and because of crowding, it became a two-person room, and I had the not best seat in the two-person room. And the nurse went to hook me up. And so the first thing that happened is I wasn't in the system. She couldn't hook me up. My registration information, my ADT, says, even though I had already been there for now 12 hours, nothing worked. She got frustrated, went out, someone else came in. They ultimately got me connected to the ADT system. And then our institution was one of the pioneers of um, bedside monitoring for pulse oximetry. We, we learned the lesson. Anesthesiologists run our safety uh, team. And they hooked me up. Well, for the next two days before I decided it was time for me to leave, and so I created a little bit of a fallacy about the flatus that had happened, um, <clears throat> they came running into my room every 15 minutes. Well, that was the first night because my heart rate had dropped to 35 or 40. Actually, that's what happens when you're out of DC and you're no longer <laughs> stressed. <laughs> <clears throat> and it was very clear that I was fine, my heart rate wasn't 35 or 40, but the system, for whatever reason, couldn't do that. So for the next two days, every 15 minutes, the alarms went off, preventing me from sleeping. Now, the nursing staff, far smarter than everybody else, they said, oh, 
it's a false alarm. We're not even going in anymore. So the alarms just kept going. Um, I would suggest that as we're doing our plug and play, as we're trying to improve things, one of the things that we've learned from the ICU is that the patient's bedside is not only a dangerous place, it's a non-healing place. And the frequent, repetitive, in many cases false alarming that goes on there uh, needs to really be addressed as a priority. And Julian, I, I, I heard what you said, and I think um, back in the 80s when I was on top of some of the devices, there were some manufacturers that built in smart cross-checking around parameters. Uh, unfortunately, they're not here anymore. So with that, I'm going to stop. Oh, I got red all of a sudden. Yeah. I don't know how you did that, but you went from green to red. You know, it's great. So thank you. ask is probably in the context of cybersecurity, but I think it applies to your space. Our work at Mayo, like other hospitals, we have equipment that has longer mechanical life than digital life. So I've got a lot of old equipment that's running XP, yeah. for example. Yeah. Cybersecurity place, we isolate it, we put it in the corner, we're good to go. But it gets in the way of what you want to do. So I really appreciate the specs for new purchasing and around new architectures, but how do we deal with this legacy problem so we don't have to cope with this for another 15 years? Well, that's an easy question, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so first of all, kudos to your organization. You've taken, I think, the global lead on cybersecurity and medical devices and have shared an enormous amount with the broader community. And uh, we're, we're leveraging it, partners, we're leveraging what you've done and looking forward to chatting more. So there are some interesting points that were raised, and I'm going to try to uh, kind of paint this picture knowing that we will have to head out to lunch. Uh, the first thing is, what do we do about old equipment, legacy equipment, and protecting that? I think that the, the best thinking right now, well, what are people doing? What are you doing at Mayo? What you're doing is you're, you're firewalling, sandboxing those things be behind some kind of segregated network. That's what everyone has to do. So that's what we're doing first. One of the things that we can't apply tomorrow, but the ICE architecture was based on was that notion of isolation at the bedside. Because not only is there a security issue and privacy, but also higher bandwidth needs. But not that we can roll that out either overnight, but it is possible, and some organizations are doing that. So that's one, one thought. Then the other thought is, what is that relationship between interoperability and cybersecurity? There's a tension that's developing. There are people who are saying, give me a medical device, Give me some glue, let me squirt it into every port because I don't want it to connect to anything because it's not safe, okay? A lot of people are thinking that way. That's totally wrong because every medical device, if it has a microprocessor, is connected to something else at some point. That's how you upgrade this, the firmware. It's how you upgrade the software. It's how you download data. It's almost impossible for, for most medical devices to exist in a vacuum. They will connect. So forget about the notion of being able to lock it down by putting glue into the ports. That's not going to happen. So then what is that relationship? Well, let's think about our IT networks here in this building, everywhere, every business, every hospital. We actually depend on interoperability to keep our network safe in every other domain. We monitor patches and upgrades and then malware. We use intrusion detection systems. We do packet inspection. Try that on a current medical device network for the most part. First of all, you can kill those devices. You could brick them. You can break them. You could interfere with an alarm transmission over a network to a central station. So I think in integral with our notion of advancing interoperability, at least in that higher acuity medical device space, is actually it's safer if we go to open standards-based approaches, just like we've done in every other system that's working in the world. So I'm here to say I think that's a, a false argument that it's a zero-sum game that some people understandably are initially making. Legacy systems today, uh, we have to greatly increase manufacturer responsiveness to events. Uh, we are just starting an initiative now with the FDA and MITRE at partners and with other hospitals to work on a pre 
preparedness initiative for medical device cybersecurity. And anyone who's interested in learning more, please speak with me afterwards. It's just kicking off now. The FDA is seeing you know, way over the horizon with this, and they deserve uh, a recognition for being proactive. So it's going to be a tough journey, but I think it's going to be sandboxing for now. And manufacturers have to start to work together with other companies to figure out how to perform better monitoring, intrusion detection, fingerprinting, and so forth. And man-in-the-middle attacks are the things that worry, worry me the most, someone spoofing data that a patient is OK when they're really not. Long answer, tough question. Sorry. We're, we're <laughs> going to have to stop now, but um, uh, maybe there'll be time to get your questions in outside for 15 minutes or uh, maybe later on. But uh, thank you all for contributing to this uh, conversation and hopefully stimulate it. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mike and panel. We're now